Welcome. Let me start by saying hello to Greta Faremo, who we're very privileged to have here, and we're very grateful because last year, in our very first interaction with Davos as an organization, on a more systemic way, Greta very kindly agreed to join an interactive panel. And we started having some very interesting conversations about organizations that play on a global stage, such as UNOPS, and how smaller companies, like those represented by the YPO, could play a role in that conversation. And here in Davos, 2020, it's the 50th anniversary, there's a huge conversation about climate and also about sustainability. And there are very few people in Davos who are as well placed to talk about sustainability and the SDGs as Greta. I will ask you to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about UNOPS for those members around the world who perhaps are not so familiar. So thank you, Maurice, and uh, my name is Greta Farmo, and I am the Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UNOPS. So what does that make me? Probably in your terms, the CEO and President of UNOPS, UN Office of Project Services. We are what I would call a technical engineering company, probably in a private sector term. We advise on infrastructure and uh, procurement and project management. We also implement. But I would say when you look at our $2 billion turnover, we are working in more than 80 countries. We are about 11,000 personnel. We are the connector, the facilitator of partnerships that uh, can help people around the world to a better future. So, of course, sustainability is in all we do. Uh, we consider environmental and social implications, and uh, we are also, of course, a nonprofit full member of the UN, but we work pretty much like a business. So we're always looking at the value add. What value can we add to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals? to drive the Agenda 2030. Not looking only at the official development aid, but going beyond. Because the Agenda 2030 is a global agenda. It is key to governments, private sector, as well as the international community. So we need to work differently to achieve these goals. And that's also why I tend to come back to you, because in this work, we really need the small and medium-sized businesses, because if I look at who are the key drivers of innovation, the breakthroughs, you probably find them mainly in that space. And when I talk of us as a facilitator and a catalyst, that's also where we now have sort of directed some of our new initiatives. I know our members will be very interested to hear how around the world in their countries, well, perhaps in the 80 of the 130 where we have members, could connect with the work that you're doing. Tell us some thoughts about, this is an open dialogue. We have no pitch, we're not trying to sell um, a particular initiative or connectivity idea that we already have. This is genuinely just brainstorming. It's why we're here. We're here to talk and to listen. What are the things that our members could do? Let's have a little conversation about some projects perhaps you have in mind that you've done as an exemplar and an idea that people can say, oh, well, you know, we could potentially do something like that. You know, what are the things that are happening around the world? How do you have those projects and how do you engage with SMEs? So think of how important public procurement is. Look at any national GDP. 
and you know that it's large money, big money that is spent on public procurement. And uh, we help and partner with a lot of governments, institutions, to uh, build stronger capacity in, uh, of course, designing tenders and also implementing tenders to drive solutions that can help the government or our partner to come up with a better result. In that space, it is really important that we and the governments understand where to look and also help us write up those tenders. Because if we don't have the companies around us who can tell us what is out there, we may actually ask for yesterday's solutions. So the UN overall procures for about $20 billion annually. So that is one space, how to interact with UN as a vendor. And the other part going beyond the UN procurement is of course, how can we, from a business perspective, engage each other to drive new sustainable solutions that also offers the opportunity, of course, for profit. And uh, we have uh, in UNOPS the management of the UN web buy. So that's an arena where you can register and actually make yourself known with your offers. But also how you engage maybe with bigger businesses because we know that some of the bigger technology companies or bigger mainstreamed global companies, they thrive actually through partnering with many of the smaller, more innovative uh, companies. And you can come through that channel as well. And I think uh, to have this practical dialogue on how to uh, engage is really important. I know a bit about time to market, so we're also looking at solutions that help us understand quickly whether this is a business opportunity or not. Can you give us some practical examples where you've, which you can recall, which worked really well in terms of engagement between yourselves and some SMEs? Just some draw so we have a picture in our mind of the kind of projects that have really worked well. I might even ask you for some that didn't and why. But just to understand you know, what people should be thinking of when they try to engage with yourselves. So of course, in uh, uh, emergencies, uh, when we are engaged in delivering solutions to uh, either UN partners or government partners, it can be, uh, so if we provide an energy solution, we need to know where to access the solar panels or the technology that is needed to provide green energy in a refugee camp or in a community that has to address this emergency. So it can be an energy uh, cluster that we work with to be able to provide solutions quickly. It can be uh, in the health sector, so where do you uh, turn when you need ambulances, where you need to equip the am ambulance, uh, ambulances to ensure that they are delivered anywhere in the world quickly. So it is just to tell you that if we are to be successful in uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, or in the Middle East, Iraq, Yemen, we cannot come after the fact and ask, so what do you have? Do you have anything in stock or not? We need to be able to uh, find solutions and uh, able to equip them quickly if something happens. That's emergency. Long term, that can be a different uh, approach, but uh, I think you understand that it is really important for us to understand 
how to cluster uh, our engagement. So maybe not with one and one and one uh, company, but find out who are sharing sort of the same objective and uh, drive what are the good solutions. Well, as this is meant to be a genuine dialogue, because as I say, we don't have a particular pitch, maybe it's something that we can discuss. Um, as an organization, we're quite widely spread, um, and a lot of them are 29,000 CEOs would have really nothing much to do in engaging with yourselves, but I know that within our audience of CEOs, there will be various businesses who have fantastic products and services that could be of use. But perhaps one of the advantages that we have is that we're nimble because we're small, but one of the disadvantages is when you come up against major international organizations like the United Nations, there's a fear of the bureaucracies, the time that's involved. There's a notion, and, and you may want to dispel that notion, that it's uh, slanted in favor of the larger corporates because they know how to deal with big organizations like yourselves. How do we dispel that notion? How can we work together to cluster the solar panel? I mean, I know one or two of our members who are in this field. You know, maybe there is something that we can do, and, and we should, you were talking to you about some of our leadership here, to think how do we cluster them together and connect them with some of the things you're doing? Maybe solar panel providers that we might have as members in different countries looking and discussing with UNOPS about potential opportunities for the future. How does, is that sort of dialogue possible? Yeah, if you go into uh, uh, statistics, uh, UNOPS produces a, a annual statistical report for our executive board. It is information provided by our UN sisters and brothers. And looking into those statistics, you will find that the bulk of the procurement that the UN does happens from small and medium-sized companies. So that is already addressing one of your myths. Uh, you don't have to be big to uh, work with the UN. But uh, if you also look at uh, how some of the initiatives we have taken, uh, what they look like, and I can mention our Global Innovation Center, that is actually connecting the bigger ones with the small entrepreneurs locally and uh, ensure that the entrepreneurs have the opportunity to work with the big ones to solve problems they see locally. They may have a business idea and we help them realize that idea through connecting them to the bigger companies, but also maybe universities and the governments. So this is already happening in the field. We have established some centers in developed countries and some in developing countries. So we're also connecting maybe uh, companies who have worked in more successful economies with those who are still developing. So centers in Sweden, now establishing one in Japan. We have in, I could mention Antigua Barbuda, where these companies, big and small, actually get together. So we are the facilitator, not really, uh, I hope, the hurdle. We're the facilitator and help them implement their business ideas. That's one. And the other one, if you register with the UN and you want to do business with the UN, I've heard much about bureaucracy. Well, actually, yes, you have to register, you have to be vetted, but when you are, you're in, and you will be notified about tenders in your relevant sectors. So that's actually also interesting to hear the feedback from small and medium-sized uh, companies who have made it they actually realized that uh, the opportunities were there and that the bureaucracy at the start 
Well, it was there, but having gone through it, it's done. Well, that's very interesting, and I may open this up to the floor here to have a little bit of a brainstorm, if we may, with you about the idea that we, we do want to have that communication. One of the advantages, one of the reasons, main reasons that people join an organization like YPO is because if you're a smaller business, you want to learn from your peers. You want to learn, you want to plug in to the global conversation, to see things partially in your industry um, and maybe other reasons you're in. So we have this thing within our organization called networks. And perhaps there are networks who might want to aggregate some of those conversations around particular areas. I mean, there are also industrial groupings within uh, YPO because we're quite diverse as a membership. So maybe there are things that we could be doing, and I'd like to put this out to some of my colleagues here, to think through, well, maybe if we got people together around, maybe you use the example of solar panels. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's or, or some sort of emergency supply. Uh, maybe we can get some of them to come together and explore with UNOPS about the processes. Because people are frightened. I was in uh, a business years ago, um, ice cream, frozen yogurt. And I remember the first time I approached an airline, I was a small company, and I went to an airline, and airlines are, to, well, to me, were a little bit like to a medium-sized company looking at UNOPS. You know, you look at these massive organizations, and you think, you don't even know how to navigate the communications, because you're just, you know, you're a startup, you're very nimble, but you're just not, ha you're not that connected. And so maybe there are some things that we could be doing about that. And so I'd like to put things out to the floor. But first, any thoughts about how, if one were to bring together some sort of connectors within YPO, how they as a, a group or maybe representatives of those groups could connect up with you in terms of looking at specific things that are of importance to UNOPS going forward? Of course, we uh, spend uh, a lot of time in uh, telling how to do business with the UN and uh, also uh, uh, have a lot of procurement seminars. They are very often organized together with uh, business associations, uh, also uh, with, uh, of course, uh, government uh, entities a uh, number of governments may have special entities who are driving innovation. So these setups may vary, but uh, they can happen uh, in countries we w where we work. They can happen together with other UN agencies as well, or they can happen in our headquarters. So uh, how we are able to, uh, to cluster, I think, uh, uh, engagement and of course uh, make them more valuable, the more energy <laughs> uh, partners will uh, put into it. Well, I'm not just putting you on the spot. I'm going to put some of my colleagues on the spot now mm -hmm. and see, are there things that we can be doing? And I'll hand over the, the, the mic to, to see how we can aggregate some of that because yeah. understandably as an organization of, of the size the United Nations is, they cannot talk to too many people all the time because they don't have enough time in the day. Um, but So the responsibility lies on us to see how we can bring some of that information together. But I do think we have a wealth of innovation uh, and energy within our membership that could be harnessed for the good, and we should see how we do that. So may I open this to the floor for more questions, suggestions, comments about how we can take things forward? I'll take one and allow me to go down to micro in, in a specific country, in a specific environment because so I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and we also build sustainable resorts in emerging markets. We're in Rakhine State in Myanmar. We're building coastal resorts. Uh, we're going solar for the village. We're doing learning and education and we're with the chief Rakhine ministers and the Minister of Energy having discussions. And obviously, as they discuss with us, we're still a micro product, but you're providing probably jobs for 500 people. What they're looking is scaling everything. So recently, we took one, one another YPO company called B-Box, which is, has an over a million people now, and which is providing electric, um, solar panel solutions off-grid from your phone to be able to open 
your, uh, your electricity from your solar panel. And, and trying to figure out how to deploy that with private fundings and so on. Is that a project that, as an entrepreneur, we are able to interact and say, hey, we got the people from the government, we're there on the ground, we think we have a solution, or it's very much top up rather than bottom up, where UN has a master plan for Myanmar, has a master plan specifically, and that's what it is, and just register, but there is no. Is it possible to bring a creative idea and be listened to? Because for me, as an entrepreneur, and this is a very interesting panel, it's even accessible. Uh, to discuss on a specific project? Uh, absolutely. Let me first say that without knowing your idea in full, there is nothing that from a principled perspective should stop you from uh, being able to test it. In Myanmar, UNOPS has one of its uh, biggest operations and we are probably the biggest UN entity working there because we're operational. So we are a selected partner of uh, many of the policy makers because we're able to make things happen. In Myanmar, it's mainly linked to uh, uh, health and fund management. So uh, we have, uh, on behalf of uh, partners like Global Fund, been managing uh, uh, large uh, sums of, of money for a long time. Uh, we help uh, local communities and uh, we also work in Rakhine. Uh, it's uh, important for us to understand how we can add the most value. So it's always a question of how broad we go in uh, single countries. Uh, so that is, of course, something that will have to be explored. In some countries, it's really important for us to engage with private partners because we know that official development aid will not flow in. So how we work with national governments to ensure they invest their money in uh, as sustainable manners as possible is also important. And sometimes it's a mix. So going to Sierra Leone, the president wanted to electrify some of the communities in the country. Only 1% in Sierra Leone has access to electricity in rural areas. So of course, there were no grids. So what do you do? So what we came up with was to put solar panels on top of uh, all the health clinics in the relevant regions. That produced enough electricity to provide predictable electricity to the health clinics, also to the local communities when using the excess uh, electricity. And now we have a private provider who is managing this and who is now investing his own money into building more off-grid energy in that particular region. Of course, you understand that connecting to ideas like uh, you just described is obviously a possibility, but it needs to be, of course, uh, thoroughly reviewed whether this is something that is viable and can be done. So very often when I hear uh, about ideas of uh, that nature, I would always think, can they connect to something that is already up and running instead of thinking greenfield? Thank you. Thank you. So <clears throat> to answer to Maurice's call for a way to scale and to offer a service or an opportunity for our members, a thought comes to mind. <clears throat> uh, so at the beginning, somewhere during this year, we launched the program and Pascal was uh, the leader of the, of the initiative to uh, identify members doing great things around the world. And so through that, through that effort, we identified 200 members in a short period of time doing great things. And they have amazing projects, so we can only recognize and, and do so much for them, giving them, highlighting them basically. But 
should there be an opportunity for them to scale and to create a multiplier effect by bringing them to your attention or bringing that community to your and so connecting those two together may give them the scaling um, germ that they need in order to to get bigger so for example i'll give you a quick example one of the members um, has a, a water project to create water tanks and um, make water more um, let's say clean water accessible and so forth and he's being recognized for his project that project could probably be in in dozens of countries, not only the countries he has access to. So could there be a scaling opportunity through your organization? I think scaling is an issue uh, to all of us. How can we help scale our ideas? Uh, since we are in infrastructure, we have done housing projects in a number of countries and where we have, of course, linked it to clean water, energy, and try to develop these uh, broader approaches. When we now have the Agenda 2030 and more stakeholders buying into that, we have been speaking with private investors, we have been speaking with pension funds, of course uh, also the larger companies, what kind of platforms could we build to bring things to scale? So what is now our affordable housing project is uh, becoming, I think, uh, one of the biggest uh, affordable homes sch schemes in the world. It's uh, 150,000 units. It's uh, in uh, Kenya, Ghana, Pakistan, India and across some Caribbean islands. These projects will go live with building the factories locally. Uh, of course, employing as many local people as possible, bringing growth to the local economies. And of course, making these homes affordable for uh, the uh, small and uh, medium sized income families. And these schemes will, of course, include also access to clean water, to the infrastructure needed uh, for these bigger schemes. So we are in the start phase, but here again, there will, of course, be an opportunity for local providers to uh, plug into these projects when implemented. It's a scheme running over 10 years, but I think for us to develop the platforms that will allow local vendors to participate, local entrepreneurs to be part of the bigger schemes are really important. So far, we can only take this to scale uh, with some big players joining us. But when that has now been put in place, I think it is time again to go sort of down and engage with the local business communities where we work. Hi, this is Scott Mordell. Just want to say thank you for being here. I'm the CEO of YPO, and we're just thrilled to have you here and to just to be able to address us in this room and also uh, virtually as, as it would go. I have a question on just behalf of business owners. So YPO, um, we, we talk about SMEs, but we're not all SMEs. Uh, we've, got, we've got a number of companies in the Global 2000, and uh, we run the whole gamut of, uh, of size. But I get the idea that there's a $20 billion spend and there's a business opportunity if, if, if somebody knows how to uh, avail themselves of that and register with the UN, become a certified vendor, and look at the, look at the registries. That's a, a common thing we do with our governments and everything anyway. I, I'm, my question for you is because we're advocating for our members to have a greater impact. And one way to have a greater impact is to implement those, those contracts, those relationships as, effect, as effectively and efficiently as possible so that the UN spend can go further. Okay, we, we, we get that. But about these innovation centers and about the SDGs, what does a business owner do? I, I, I'm confused as to how we, how we engage that kind of conversation to do something. Do I wait to, for 
my governmental chamber of commerce to kind of create opportunities and discussions with the UN, or do I wait for y YPO to do stuff, or how do, uh, just can you give us, give a, don't talk to me, talk to a business owner, how, uh, how can they access and engage with the UN for, 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 for uh, impact? Thank you for that question, and uh, you should not wait. <laughs> Uh, you're actually in it, uh, we're all in it together already. Uh, and I think uh, everyone needs to reflect on how do I uh, do uh, sustainable business going forward. And uh, just to give you uh, uh, the dimensions uh, from an economical perspective, this was never for the official development aid that counts for about 150 billion annually. It's quite sizable, but what will be required to implement these sustainable development goals ha has been calculated at uh, maybe closer to five trillion dollars annually. And uh, there are a lot of numbers flying in the air, but uh, most of that will have to come from the private sector. And the gap is substantial. Uh, research is saying maybe a trillion annually. So what, what is sustainable business development? I think you and I can come up with a lot of definitions. There is, at the moment, no fixed definition, but we know that it has to do, for instance, uh, about uh, green, uh, greening the economy, so uh, the emission uh, need to go down uh, and also we need to have a more socially viable and um, uh, more I think fair distribution of wealth around the world so what does this do to your particular businesses I think we all need to ask that question and uh, see how we can sort of help drive what we do in a more sustainable manner this will require new partnerships. I'm sure governments are uh, realizing this, looking for new partners to help drive innovation nationally and internationally. UN has its role to play and we're trying to, as I said, be an even better connector. We cannot do this alone, whether we sit in our business or we sit in governments or, or UN. And uh, actually to find these venues where we can accelerate, bring things to scale, drive new breakthroughs, because I'm sure they're out there. And uh, sometimes we are faced with problems where we know that we have to think differently. If you are to provide health services to a country like South Sudan, you can only look at the number of roads, and they are literally washed away uh, during uh, the rainy season. So if you want to deliver health services, it cannot go via driving on the roads. You have to think, what do you do virtually? How do you use new technology? Maybe you have to use new drone technology, or for what I know. So uh, thinking these new solutions, I think we do it better together. My name is Leili and I'm from Iran. I'm just um, listening to this. I wanted to give you an example of my experience with the UN and why I think it would be really good to have some kind of a representation or a connect between YPO and, and, and the UN. Um, we, um, well, we have one of our companies is an IT company, so we set up um, an IT fund to help 700 um, disabled children schools. And um, I have a company that's a partner with UNICEF in Iran. So when I contacted UNICEF, they connected me to headquarters UNICEF in New York. And they have developed an IT solution on an iPad that is scalable and cheap, but in English, where we could Iran Iranianize the system, scale it, affordably for these 700 schools and we had investors for it and it's going actually really well. Later down the line, which is probably 10 days or two weeks ago, I realized that the software was developed by a YPOer for headquarters of UNICEF in New York. 
And I was like, you know, if we need to share resources, we need to share knowledge, we need to share, and resources could be human resources, capital resources, knowledge resource, and how can I, as a YPO member, with two chapters, not know that such thing exists for my private company or family business that is developing impact on IT for education. So how can we connect these dots to, to make it more efficient with distance, time, cost, and everything else? And this is um, just a question up in the air. I would like to just reiterate the question of our CEO, Scott, because I don't know if he got a clear answer. For me, the, what he was asking was, how does a private enterprise actually interact with UNOPS? That I didn't get the clear, did you get? Yes. No, so, so that's what we, because UNOPS is a big organization. Practically speaking, is there a designated division, person, somebody who YPO can knock on the door and, and get a yes or no? So to pick up on that question, uh, of course uh, we have uh, country managers in a number of countries. And if we are present, I would say uh, you should knock on the local door uh, to understand what is going on locally. Sometimes that country manager is managing uh, our projects in a region. So understanding what is going on in a region and see if it's relevant directly to the <coughs> projects we manage. We manage around a thousand projects every year. So there may be business relevance directly in, in our own operations. If uh, it uh, is going uh, uh, more broadly, for instance, into procurement. We have a procurement division. So to register with that procurement division, headquartered in uh, Copenhagen, is another opportunity. They can guide you into how it is to register with our sort of procurement platforms that we also manage on behalf of the rest of the UN. So uh, that will give you a wider access to, uh, as I mentioned, tenders going out from, from other parts of the UN as well. So this is uh, an opportunity that will have to be sort of reviewed and managed by you individually. So I think the business opportunities here uh, are uh, multiple. But if you really would like to have the uh, sort of email address, that's probably also uh, something that we, in the end, can provide you with uh, if uh, we talk that sort of practical approach, how to start the process of being registered. But may I also address the second or the first question here? Because UN was established as it looks today by the member states. So clearly, when you look at our now 75 years of history, uh, UN is maybe not organized as uh, we would have done it in 2020 uh, from a commercial perspective. Well, UN is not commercial. The member states have decided the setup, and one of the consequences of the setup of the funds and programs is that there is unfortunately not the sharing of information and the efficiency uh, in uh, how we operate that you may expect from each other. So with all the deficiencies uh, the UN system may hold, we are still improving. I think the awareness around we need to improve our way of sharing information is significant, but I cannot offer you, uh, uh, well, a date for when there will be this uh, good and efficient uh, information sharing among the agencies, but we have to do better than what we have been able to do so far.
it's a, it's a suggestion. Just, just for a just one yes, suggestion. Why PO with 29,000 members? If you can consider appointing one point person only for YPO at UNOX, I can tell you that person will be more than pay well cover his cost and their uh, return because the amount of opportunity you'll get from YPO members who are all entrepreneurs will be making a big impact. I, I want to say there are probably three challenges here, and one is for you, and two is for, uh, two are for us, and I'll start with us to give you a second. Uh, to be fair, so Lely's fantastic uh, point, which is an internal communication. You know, there are things that we don't know about one another's businesses. You talked about IT, we talked about solar panels. So maybe one challenge is how we, between us, create a dialogue which enables us to aggregate that information because 29,000, even with Greta giving us an email, 29,000 emails will just be amounts that would just not be read or, or, or action. So what we need to do is work out how we aggregate that conversation amongst ourselves. The other suggestion that Scott's challenge, which is quite right, is then, okay, well now we've got that information, how do we channel that conversation to the challenge to you? So now we've got our two challenges, and, and, and I appeal to our members around there for champions, because we're a member-led organization, meaning that those of us, and some of us give a lot more than others who are in, the, uh, there are those here who have done an unbelievable amount of work for this organization. It's all done for free, and this is the, 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 their way to give back to the, to, to the world. And our um, overly taxed central resources can't take this on as well, but what we can do is appeal to those who will do one of those two things. One, help to aggregate, perhaps in different areas, um, and then the other is to bring that information together to yourselves, now to you. How, how do you respond to that, if we were to be able to do this, because last year you were wonderful in helping to catalyze our very first interaction with Davos, as it's playing on the world stage with these agendas. Here you've helped us to bring that further forward. We want impact, we want concrete things. Next year, if we're gonna be sitting here, we wanna be looking back and saying, hey, you know, as a result of that, we set up the following structures that actually led to a change which will help us to deliver impact. How do you think you could perhaps respond to that? So I think this uh, has to be uh, sort of developed further. But when I mentioned our global innovation centers, they came as a result of uh, our review of, OK, we want to be and we are a connector, a facilitator. So in the space of technology, clearly we have uh, been approached by companies of different uh, sizes, government, entrepreneurs, uh, academia, and how can we put these uh, stakeholders into a network that can help each other to add value, to drive the Agenda 2030? Maybe this kind of approach is also uh, something that should be explored. Uh, because I think it's so important that we find ways uh, of working together uh, where we do more than one plus one becomes two. It's actually how we can make the one plus one become 11, yeah? Okay, now you have yeah. raised the bar. <laughs> well, with that, I think that is a fantastic opportunity, a challenge and an opportunity for us and hopefully somebody out there from our 29,000 will put their hand up and stand up as a champion. It's certainly unlikely to be me, um, who will say that they would love to start, the, and it could be several, because we could be looking at people who are doing different areas, you were talking about, say, looking at this from a industry perspective or a regional perspective. We could look at how we manage that conversation and, and the appeal to everybody is reach out, whether it's to Scott Mortel or to Pascal Gherkin, don't reach out to me so much if you can. <laughs> and, and let's give us your name, say that you're interested in doing this, and then once we have the appropriate interlocutor, we can then come to you and say, 
here's what we're <coughs> suggesting and tell us how you want to engage with us. I'm looking forward to it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you.